Now let's talk about producing Huffman codes. And I'm talking about this now because we'll use a greedy approach to producing the codes. But first, let's look at the background to see what this is all about. So there's many times that we would like to save disk space or we would like to reduce the amount of information being transmitted over a network by compressing files. So we want to perform compression. Now there's two basic types of compression. They are lossy compression and lossless compression. Lossy compression is where we throw away some of the information uh, in order to save space. Now you may be thinking, well geez, if you throw away stuff, isn't that gonna be a problem? Well, it depends. Every time you watch a movie on a DVD, you're actually experiencing lossy compression because many image formats and many audio formats throw away some of the information. And in fact, you've done something similar probably. When you use your calculator, if you were to get this answer on your calculator, 3.8701569, maybe you wrote down the answer as 3.87 and you threw away this information right here. Now, depending on the situation, that may be a problem or it may not be a problem. But at least at that time, you didn't think it'd be an issue. And looking in isolation, there's no way for somebody to look at 3.87 and realize this is the part that you threw away. Okay, so that would be a form of compression. I used four positions of spacing, 3.87, to represent this overall value. Okay, so there is, there is a place for this. The other type, which is what we're gonna focus on though, is what's called lossless compression. And in lossless compression, you can reconstruct the original information from the compressed version. You would use this on text files, for example. And even when, when I was talking earlier about various video and audio formats, they also use some lossless compression, okay? But we're gonna focus on this, and specifically, we're gonna see it as applied to text, because that's easier to understand. But keep in mind that there's lots of file formats that could make use of lossy or lossless compression. Now in the United States, when we create what are called text files, there is a file format that uses something called ASCII, and that's a character set. ASCII stands for American Standard Code for Information Interchange. And so what happens is we have 128 different characters, and so ultimately each of those is represented by seven bits. Now on my computer, bytes are eight bits, so these will actually take up eight bits of space. And so that's things like the lowercase a, which is different than uppercase a, the three character, the question mark, some unprintable characters like new lines or line feeds, or actually new lines, are, it's an abstraction actually, so line feeds and carriage returns. Those are really how you produce new lines, all right? So this is well known. And so in base 10, the numerical value of a lowercase a is 97, which has a bit representation of 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. So that's the base two or bit or binary uh, representation using bits, these eight bits. And as you can see, it starts with a zero. And in fact, all 128 of the ASCII characters begin with a zero. But like I said, on my computer, these would be stored as a single byte. So ultimately we'll have eight bits. So how is that relevant to what we're talking about? Well, in English, different letters show up with different frequencies. So I got this from the Wikipedia page. And so according to the Wikipedia page, if we're talking about English text as a whole, the letter E shows up about 13% of the times. Uh, T shows up about 9.1% of the time. The letter A shows up 8.2% of the time. X shows up about 0.15% of the time. Q shows up about 0.095% of the time. And Z shows up about 0.074% 
of the time. Now, depending on what you're looking at, which book, which article, whatever, these numbers may not be entirely true. But certainly from personal experience, that I know that in general, the letters E, T, and A show up much more often than X, Q, and Z. So that part is going to be true in the general sense. So how is that relevant? Well, up here, all of these ASCII characters take 8 bits of space. But what if I had the bit pattern, or I mean, excuse me, I had the character string, E, E, Q. Well, E shows up much more often than Q. So instead of giving every single character 8 bits of space, right? So we have 8 plus 8 plus 8 equals 24 bits. What if I use, say, only two bits for the E's? If these were the only letters I had, this wouldn't really be what I would do. But because E shows up much more frequently, maybe I use fewer characters for it, say two. And for the Q, I make up for using less for E by using more for Q, so maybe I use 10. So then I would have 2 plus 2 plus 10 equals 14 bits, saving 10 bits here. Now, for this particular example, this would actually be a problem because ASCII is well known. And therefore, if I have a text file, there's lots of uh, software programs that understand ASCII and can read this bit pattern and translate it into a character A. It's already known. If I was going to use a particular 2-bit pattern for E's and a particular 10-bit pattern for Q's, I would have to include that in my data file or have a program that looks specifically for that bit pattern, which means that this 14 bits, if the, if the mapping that says what 2 bits, let's say it's 1, 0. I'm just making this up. But let's say 1, 0 represents E's. Well, I would have to have something in my data file that says wherever you see 1, 0, replace it with an E, which means I have really some overhead in the data file. So for this particular example, compressing it would actually take up more space probably than the 24 bits. Okay, but that's the idea, is that we can use a variable length bit pattern in place of something like this by using frequency information to make smarter decisions. So it's really an optimization problem. But let's see how that works. But before we get to that, let's use this uh, string. So here I have E, Q, T, E, A, T, Z, A, A, T. Right. And so uh, if I have this right here, we can see that my letters or characters and their counts. So we'll put these in alphabetical order. A, E, Q, T, Z. A shows up one, two, three times. And there's 10 characters, so that's 30% of the time. E shows up one two times, that's 20%. Q shows up once, T shows up one two three, and Z shows up once. So that's 10%, 30%, and 10% again. So if I use these as ASCII, just using ASCII characters, then we would have 10 characters times 8 bits per character, which would be 80 bits. Now, if I only have these five letters, maybe what I look at and say, oh, well, I could do something like this. What if I used, you know, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, and 1, 0, 0. Now, I'm only using three characters for each, but this is fixed in length. But nonetheless, for my 10 characters, I have 10 times 3 bits per character, which is 30 bits. But then I also would need to include my overhead. So if this scaled up, if I really had like 10,000 characters with these percentages, the overhead would be relatively small. If I only have 10 characters, it's relatively large. So maybe this doesn't work. But it's just an example to show you. All right? But where do I come up with these? These right here are what we call our code words. So if we're going to have variable length, 
I want to come up with, you know, in this case, use a few characters for the A and the T since they occur most frequently, since they occur most frequently, followed by then the E, followed by the Q and the Z. All right. But let's say I did something like this. Let's just, we just use the letters A, B, and C. So let's say A and B show up more frequently than C. So I say I'm going to use a zero here, one here, and then one zero here. Okay, so I have different code words for each. There's a problem with this. If you see the bit pattern, one zero, is that a C? Or is that an A, or excuse me, a B? Is that a B followed by an A? Well, it's ambiguous. I could deal with that actually by using some type of separator. So for example, if you saw one comma zero comma one zero, well then we would say, well that's B, that's A, that's C. But now I have to deal with this and probably store something for that. So we would like to come up with what's called a prefix code. Or some people use the term prefix free, since that seems to match up more with what we're thinking about. But the idea there is that in a prefix code, none of the code words is a prefix for another code word. The one shows up at the beginning of the B as well as the beginning of the C right here, right? Or the entire one is, is here. It's not just at the beginning. So that's where you get the ambiguity. As soon as you see this one, you're going, well, is that just a B? Or is it the beginning of a C? Okay, so this is not a prefix code. So that's going to lead us now to Huffman codes. So the idea, using the same example here, is that we said, okay, we're going to put these in order, and we'll put them in mathematical order. So Q is once, Z is once, E is twice, A is three times, T is three times, All right? And so we're going to produce a Huffman tree using a greedy approach. And that then will lead to Huffman codes. which would be our prefix codes. So how does this work? We're going to look at which of these things are the smallest and combine the two smallest. So if I do that, I have Q here, Z here, and their combined value is 1 plus 1, which is 2. Now, could I put Z here and Q here? Sure. I'm just keeping them in order. But you could do either one. As long as you know how to map them back, it won't change the number of bits that we produce. It just changes which bit patterns represent each. So now I have this. I still have E is 2, A is 3, and T is 3. And that should be here. This isn't here. All right? So now I take the two smallest. Here's 2. Here's 2. So I'm going to get 4 here. There's my E. Okay. Now what do we have? We also have A is 3 and T is 3. Let me move over to here. So now I combine the next two smallest. So we have a 3 and a 3. So those actually go together. Okay. So we would have... Um, And so this is 6. And now we're going to combine these. And so the total is the 10, right? Because that's what this adds up to. And then we have that right there. So there's our Huffman tree. Okay. So how do we get our Huffman codes from this? Well, what I'm going to do is move down the tree 
and every left branch will receive a zero and every right branch gets a one and now I go through back through my characters so we had a e q t z and the code words So A is one zero, E is one one, or sorry, this is uh, T, this is T here, sorry, this is, T was one one, zero one, is the E, zero 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 is the Q, and zero zero one is the Z. So does that save us any space? Remember the counts were three, two, one, three, one. And so here's two bits. So our number of bits, three times two is six, two times two is four, one times three is three, three times two is six, and one times that is three. So total here, so that's 10, nine, so it's 19 and three is 22 bits plus overhead. Remember when we used fixed size, we had 30. And when we used standard ASCII, we had 80. So this is our Huffman codes from this Huffman tree using a greedy approach. So how did it really work? Well, notice what's happening here is by co combining the smallest first and then new values actually make the tree grow up instead of down. That means at the end, those characters that occur most frequently are closer to the top, which means that when we assign the bits, they get fewer bits. So I went one, one here. But as I worked my way all the way down to get to the Q and the Z, I had more bits. Okay? And as you can imagine, if I had additional characters instead of just five, the tree can be much taller. And so, you know, maybe I have something that's... And this really should be... Maybe something like this. Okay, where this is just a single character, this would be a one. And then you got, I'm just making this up so this may not actually be how it could work out. But then one, two, three for this, one, two, three for this, one, two, three, four for these, something like that. Okay, so that's the greedy approach to producing a Huffman tree from which we drive the Huffman codes. All right, and in terms of approaches, to assigning code words to individual characters, this is actually optimal. It's not unique for because we saw some ambiguity here. And so if I swap the Q and the Z, if I swap the A and the T, it just moves the tree around, but it won't change the total number of bits used to represent all the characters. So in that sense, it's really the best we can do.